Good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm Joe Barone. I'm the dean of the uh, pharmacy school, the Ernest Mario School of Pharmacy, which, as you know, is right next door. And it's my uh, pleasure to introduce today's uh, symposium. Uh, I, I just want to give you a little bit of background on how we got here. Uh, I encourage you to, I won't bore you with all of the details, but just take one of the flyers. Yes, I, I took it off the board, sorry. Uh, and uh, you get a little bit of uh, idea of what we're trying to do today, but uh, just a little bit about how we got here. Uh, our two speakers, uh, David Algieri and Brian Strom, uh, are both on our faculty. Uh, and um, before uh, joining uh, the uh, School of Pharmacy and uh, CINJ as a research professor in medicinal chemistry, uh, David Algieri has a storied history. He worked in the oncology space uh, he's done work with CINJ. He worked at uh, BMS, uh, and he essentially was the architect for saxagliptin, uh, which is a very exciting uh, class of drugs to treat uh, diabetes. Uh, by background, he has a doctorate in synthetic organic chemistry from UC Irvine, uh, an NIH postdoc uh, from Princeton, um, and he works very closely with us um, at the School of Pharmacy and at CINJ. And just a general nice guy uh, all around, and a very smart guy. Uh, the other speaker, uh, Brian Strom, also a smart guy and a nice guy, uh, the, uh, is uh, our inaugural chancellor for RBHS. And his major research field is in the area of pharmacoepidemiology. Um, some folks call him the founder of pharmacoepidemiology, and he's done a lot of pioneering work looking at uh, large databases sort of on the back end of drug discovery. So essentially what's cool about this seminar today is that we have two individuals uh, who essentially are looking at this compound uh, from both sides of the drug development uh, spectrum. And sometimes when we think of drug development, we think of the preclinical and then the human trials um, and then some post-marketing. But here we have the very early part uh, and the later part once a drug is, uh, is, is out. So, so that's how this whole idea started. Uh, David came to me and said, you know, uh, the chancellor is doing a lot of research uh, with this compound. Uh, working with the FDA and governmental agencies, I developed a drug. Don't you think it would be a great idea to put together a symposium uh, where we will look at this very important class of drugs from both ends of the spectrum? So what I'm going to be doing is presenting um, what are really ongoing um, saxagliptin and pharmacoepidemiology studies. Um, we had three cuts of data, uh, two preliminary um, inter well, uh, four cuts of data, um, descriptive results that I'll show you, uh, two interim sets of results, I'll, I'll show you the second of those, um, and uh, the final results. We're, we are in the process of doing the final analyses now. So to the degree I know the answer, if it, if, uh, um, in the final results, if it differs from the, the, what, what I'll, I am presenting, I, I will point that out. So again, as, as with David's talk, there's a team of people involved in, in doing any of the studies, uh, in doing any uh, significant study. These are the investigators, study sponsors, and the data source collaborators, and these are adjudicators that we used uh, in the study as well as former team members. <coughs> um, and again, the, the post-marketing surveillance studies um, done at Penn, and here uh, the bulk of the work is being done at, at Penn. Uh, where we started it, though I'm still involved here. <coughs> From a disclosure point of view, the sponsor um, now is AstraZeneca, um, uh, who approved the study protocol. Have, they have the right to provide non-binding comments, which, some of which we regularly ignore. Um, and uh, the, the initial co-sponsor in addition was Bristol-Myers Squibb. This was, as you heard, a BMS drug. It was marketed jointly between BMS and, and AstraZeneca. And very recently, AstraZeneca took it over completely. So what I'll go through with you is a little bit, let me put it in context first and, and go over with you a little bit about, um, a, a, a tiny bit about pharmacoepidemiology and the role of pharmacoepidemiology. So I'll review with you the current drug approval process, pharmacoepidemiology, talk 
more about um, uh, saxagliptin from uh, a question point of view and a clinical context point of view, our study design and, and some of the initial results. So first, the current drug approval process, as most of you uh, probably know, <coughs> the um, drugs are approved based on preclinical studies, and you just heard an elegant description of those. Uh, and then three phases of clinical studies. Dose es phase one is typically dose escalation in normal, uh, uh, pay, uh, normal individuals, often medical students. Uh, the the um, uh, phase two is dose ranging studies, is typically for most drugs the first time in patients, um, though for anti cancer drugs and some anti infectives, uh, patients get even um, uh, phase one drugs. Um, phase, phase three of the pivotal trials for registration, FDA typically requires at least two large randomized trials uh, as the pivotal trials for registration. Sometimes drugs are approved based on just one, though. Um, and then phase four studies, um, you know, this is the time of marketing. And then phase four is after marketing. Phase four studies are not always required, though increasingly they now are. Um, <coughs> limitations of pre-marketing studies are well-known, carefully selected subjects for pre-marketing studies may not be, reflect the real-life patients in whom the drug will be used. Study subjects may receive better care than real-life subjects. Um, a short duration of treatment inevitably before marketing, or you'd never get a drug on the market. Um, no information on comparative effectiveness among different drugs. It's simply pre-marketing studies are based on exposed versus uh, uh, placebo trials. Um, increased development costs have led to an increased need for huge sales, immediate sales, so-called blockbuster drugs and aggressive uh, marketing practices. Um, you know, the typical drug is studied in 500 to 3,000 patients before marketing. Um, and then because of how expensive it is to get a drug on the market, the company launches into immediate widespread advertising um, and, and widespread use, including direct-to-consumer ads, which lead to overuse of the drug by patients in whom the drug is not compelling. I can't tell you the number of patients I saw who came to me with an ad for a drug or an ad they saw on television uh, saying, Doc, should I be on this drug? And my answer to them, you see those drugs on TV, uh, those are exactly the ones you don't want to take. Um, because if you really needed it, I would have given it to you already if it was a major advance. And we don't know what its effects really are and, uh, as of the time of marketing, because the number of patients exposed are limited. Um, and they also happen to be the most expensive drugs. So those are the ones you want to avoid. Yet development programs with 3,000 patients by definition, it's purely baked into the statistics, can't reliably detect adverse reactions that have an incidence of less than one in a thousand, even if severe. So with <coughs> 3,000 patients, you can reliably pick up one in a hundred adverse reactions. You can't pick up one in a thousand adverse reactions or less than that, even if it's killing people. Um, they, it, it will be missed, and it's purely baked into the statistics. Um, in response to that F FDA, um, increasingly um, is, is uh, prolonging pre-marketing studies to require 5,000 or 8,000 subjects. That adds absolutely nothing from a statistical point of view to go beyond 3,000 patients. You need 30,000 patients, not 5,000 or 8,000 patients. And yet 5,000 or 8,000 patients markedly increases the cost of the drug and of developing a drug and prolongs the development of the drug. Um, um, and I know of a number of drugs that were dropped from development at that point because it wasn't worth, worth doing. Makes no sense whatsoever. Um, you would have to be 30,000. That's not practical to get uh, before marketing. Um, but, but that's the, the problems with the system as we now have it. The result is that 51% of patients have label changes due to major safety issues. These are not small issues. Major safety problems discovered after marketing. 20% of drugs get new black box warnings after marketing, 4% of drugs are ultimately withdrawn for safety reasons. I refer to these as opportunities because these are the ones we know about. How many other major safety problems are there out there that we don't know about? <coughs> so the net effect <coughs> is that the public misunderstands safety because supposedly FDA assures a drug is safe and effective. What does safe mean? The public misunderstands thinking that a post-marketing discovery of a drug adverse reaction means somebody messed up, when in fact it's purely baked into the system. The, the, it will always happen. It is, does not mean either the company or the FDA failed. 
there's increasing concern about the safety of our drugs, and that overreaction, as I alluded to, leads to increased pre-marketing requirements by FDA, leading to delayed access to drugs and drugs drop from development. Well, the, the solution to this, quote unquote, is pharmacoepidemiology. What is pharmacoepidemiology? It studies the effects and the uh, sorry, the use and the effects of drugs in populations. So it studies the use and effects of drugs in populations. It applies the methods of epidemiology, which studies large numbers of, of, of people, to the content area of clinical pharmacology. So as a, a graphic, from a perspective, you have, uh, as you go from, from bench to bedside to population, you have the preclinical studies, proof of concept studies, um, and the efficacy studies. And David showed us this and showed us results of the efficacy studies. Um, and then you move to clinical effectiveness studies and effect studies of the effect of policies about drug use. This is where pharmacoepidemiology falls. Um, they, it it complements the pre-marketing kind of work that you, you saw from David. The options in study design that we have after marketing uh, are analytic studies, descriptive studies. Uh, analytic studies include experimental studies, prospective uh, or retrospective cohort studies, or case control studies. Descriptive studies include analysis of secular trends, case reports, and case series. The, these are basically the general approaches that you have in epidemiology in general. Just to make sure I, we're all using the same terms, um, a case control study uh, is a disease comparing patients uh, with, sorry, is a study comparing patients with a disease to patients without the disease, looking for differences in prior risk factors. So it compares cases to controls, people without the disease, looking for differences in prior exposures. Its major use is the study of any of a number of risk factors or etiologies for a single disease, especially a relatively rare disease. And that's because you keep enrolling patients until you have enough people with that disease. And um, then you can study any possible cause of that disease. The limitation is certain specific biases that have to be avoided. For example, historically obtained data have to be complete and accurate. It's easy for me to say pedagogically you choose people without a disease as controls. But if you choose the wrong people without a disease, you're going to get the wrong answer. Um, and the selection of the correct control group for a case control study can be subtle. Also, collection of retrospective data can generate problems. <coughs> That's in contrast to a cohort study, which is a study comparing patients with a risk factor exposure to others without a risk factor exposure, looking for differences in outcomes. The, again, com a study comparing people with an exposure to people without the exposure or with an alternative exposure, looking for differences in outcome. Its so major use is the study of any of a number of outcomes from a single risk factor or exposure. Limitation is these studies can be prolonged and costly. But as you might imagine, when you're talking about post-marketing surveillance of new drugs, cohort studies can be a very useful design because you have a single exposure, which is the drug of interest, and you can study a number of different outcomes from that single exposure. <coughs> so just graphically to, to make, uh, hopefully drive home the point, case control cohort give you the same basic information inherent in this so-called two by two table, um, whether people are exposed or not, whether people are diseased or not. A cohort study approaches it in this direction, whether exposure is present or absent, and the process of the study looks for whether there's a difference in subsequent disease. Case control study approaches it this way, backwards, whether a disease is present or absent, that is whether people are cases or the controls, and the process of the study is looking for antecedent exposures. Now we use these terms, most epidemiologists, at least a plurality of epidemiologists at least, maybe a majority, um, use these terms uh, cohort and case control in preference to the older terms, prospective and retrospective, reserving those to refer to a time sense where prospective study goes on simultaneously with the events under study, a retrospective study goes on after the events under study, somehow recreating those events that happened in the past, um, typically using interviews, chart abstracts, medical record reviews, or nowadays using modern databases, uh, claims or medical record databases commonly. Now, um, most cohort studies are prospective, most case control studies are retrospective, which is why the terms used to be used synonymously. But you certainly can have either prospective or retrospective cohort studies. And you even, in theory, could have prospective or, or retrospective case control studies, although prospective case control study is extraordinarily inefficient 
and so almost never done. So let's talk about saxagliptin. Saxagliptin, as you heard, is a potent DPP-4 inhibitor. Uh, as of the time of marketing, um, 2009 this was, its safety in real world settings was unknown. <coughs> there were <coughs> the, a series of questions that emerged out of the pre-marketing data, some of them specific to uh, saxagliptin, like the, the, the T cell uh, and infection risk that you heard about, some of them more class effects or even just anti-diabetic drug effects like the cardiovascular disease, as you heard about from David. So a series of observational cohort studies were requested by the, the regulators to evaluate clinically important outcomes. These were originally mandated by FDA and EMA. EMA is the regulatory body in Europe. Um, uh, not atypically, they asked for different studies. <laughs> um, it doesn't matter that you, they're starting with the same data. Their questions were different. Um, and so we designed studies to answer all of them. Um, previously published um, studies at that, as of that point, again, real-world safety data were lacking. Um, there were case reports about acute kidney injury among hospitalized patients uh, on saxagliptin. In terms of serious infection, as you heard, there was a dose-related decrease in mean lymphocyte count observed pre-marketing, which led to questions about um, uh, infection in general, in particular TB and zoster, uh, uh, um, the, that um, uh, B cell uh, uh, dependent infections. Acute liver failure, a few studies evaluated the risk of acute liver failure associated with other anti-diabetic drugs. There were no studies that have evaluated risk of acute liver failure associated with the DPP-4 inhibitors. Despite the lack of any basis for hypothesis, the regulators were worried about it. Um, cardiovascular disease, pre-marketing data actually suggested a beneficial effect. Um, I was there at the, the FDA hearings uh, on, on this drug as a consultant to the manufacturer. Um, and the pre-marketing randomized trial data, the clinical data, were really very impressive that the, the drug looked like it prevented heart disease in contrast to other anti-diabetic drugs. Um, and, and in fact, if you meta-analyzed the pre-marketing studies, they were statistically significant protective effect against heart disease. And in part for that reason, the company not only did our studies that they had to do from a regulatory point of view, but launched it to an, a, a large randomized outcome study after marketing, hoping that they were going to get a label change, um, that the drug prevented cardiovascular disease. Didn't work. We'll get, get to that later. <clears throat> As I said, a recent clinical trial showed no increase or decrease in rate of cardiovascular event, but an increased rate of hospitalization for heart failure, which was not an a prior hypothesis. So that may, may or may not be real, um, but, but that post-marketing large uh, um, uh, outcome study did not confirm a benefit uh, uh, on cardiovascular disease. Finally, hypersensitivity was another hypothesis that, that was raised by regulators be before marketing. There were no data um, to suggest the drug would uh, cause hypersensitivity more than other drugs, but, but it was something they, the company was asked to address. So in response, we uh, designed a study looking at uh, adult type 2 diabetics who initiated saxagliptin compared to patients initiating other oral anti-diabetic drugs. And our goal was to look at these five outcomes, the five outcomes that, that were of concern um, um, as of the time of marketing. Acute kidney injury, serious infection, acute liver disease, hospitalizations with major adverse cardiovascular events, and hospitalizations with severe hy hypersensitivity reactions. Design was a series of retrospective cohort studies. So this, I told you cohort studies can be retrospective. These were retrospective cohort studies. And we used four data sources to do this. US Medicare, and as of the time of, we, I, we did this data cut that I'm going to show you. Um, we were looking at 2009 to 2011 data. Health Core data, Health Core Integrated Research Database. At the time of the cut of this data, we, that, that's a database with Blue Cross data from multiple different states, Blue Cross data. Um, so uh, we looked at, at that point, uh, 2009 to 2012 data. <clears throat> and then two UK databases, um, both cases 2009 to 2011 at the time of this data cut. One is uh, the clinical practice uh, research data link, the other the health improvement network. These are two medical record databases from the United Kingdom. Um, in the US, you look at claims data, um, which are complete from a population point of view. <clears throat> we will never have a meaningful uh, usable, from an epidemiologic point of view, 
medical record database in the United States because we don't have a health system. Um, we have lots of different health systems, but nothing's population based. <clears throat> you know, my practice in Philadelphia before I got here, if I, pre- at Penn, if I prescribed a drug to somebody and that per- person had a side effect of the drug, they could just as soon have gone to Jefferson for the care and that would, for the side effect, and it never would have been in our medical record. And for, that is why U.S. medical record systems will never be complete enough in order to be able to uh, be useful. So we went to the UK, which has a health system, where everyone is a general practitioner. All data base, all, all the data flows back to that general practitioner who acts as a gatekeeper in accessing specialists and, and, and other care. And we went to the, G, to the UK for data. They have two different data systems. They do overlap. <clears throat> and so we excluded the overlapping patients uh, as part of the analysis. The data we collected, demographic information, geographic location, current and prior uh, other anti-diabetic drug use. The severity of their diabetes as best as we could come up with a surrogate. And we did that by looking at diagnoses of diabetes complications um, as as a sense of of, of their their severity. We looked at the hemoglobin A1C. That was only in the UK data because that was in the electronic health records. That isn't in claims data. So you, you can't get that in the US. Um, and other medical com- comorbidities. These were the primary outcome variables, uh, primary um, uh, confounders and variables that we analyzed. The study patients, in terms of in- in- inclusion and exclusion, are shown here. Our, um, this is the exposed group. This is the comparator group. The index drug for the exposed group was saxagliptin. Comparator group was n- non-DPP4 other uh, uh, anti-diabetic drugs. Uh, and we excluded the DPP-4s from that because if, if there was a class effect here, we didn't want to mask a difference between saxagliptin and the controls because the, the controls also included DPP-4 inhibitors. <coughs> Eligibility criteria for both groups, 18-plus uh, years of age, newly prescribed the index drug, enrolled in the database for 180 days or more prior to the first index drug prescription. Exclusion criteria, Use of insulin, uh, exenatide, I'm not pronouncing that right. Um, And that was because these were contraindicated. Use of it with Saxa was contraindicated by the label. We did secondary analyses that I won't show you the results of, uh, adding back those patients. It didn't change anything in in, in terms of the results. Um, And we also excluded people who had the specific outcomes we were looking at prior to the first prescription. So when we were looking at liver disease, we excluded people who had had liver disease before they got the saxagliptin. Well, but if they had an MI before they got the saxagliptin, they were included. When we look at MIs, we excluded people who had had an MI prior to their first prescription for saxagliptin. If they had had prior liver disease, we would include them. So those exclusions differed for each of the five different outcomes. We specifically excluded people who had had that outcome before they got the drug of interest, because obviously the outcome wasn't due to the drug if they had it before they got the drug. Um, in the exposed group, we took everybody. In the control group, we took up to 10 people per SAXA patient matched on age, sex, and geography. We had plenty of other uh, uh, anti-diabetic users. We didn't need to take them all, um, but we, did, we took a 1 to 10 ratio if, if, uh, to the degree we could. Um, so why a non-DPP4 inhibitor, other anti-diabetic drug, as I alluded to, uh, non-DPP4 uh, inhibitor initiators, initiators, the goal was to avoid missing associations that were class effects of DPP-4s in general. Why did we look at new users? Because patients may be prescribed, uh, newly prescribed Saxa or another oral anti-diabetic drug with or without existing uh, therapy. So we collected data on any previous drug and we separately did analyses of switchers versus add-on therapy. So again, the goal, Saxa was a new drug, so we wanted people who were being newly placed on a different anti-diabetic drug. And in either case, if they had been on prior drugs before, we collected the data on the prior drugs before, and we controlled for that analytically in the analysis. So the general approach was to look at saxagliptin inhibitors, compare them to other um, uh, oral anti-diabetic drugs, um, and the index date was the date of the first prescription um, or in a medical record database or the first uh, claim 
um, uh, in, for prescription uh, in, in the claims database, <clears throat> compare between the two, we ended follow-up for each patient if they developed the study endpoint, if they were prescribed the DPV-4, if they discontinued the drug, which we defined as no further prescription or drug claim within 30 days after the last prescription's uh, 30, uh, uh, 30 days supply. So you take the last prescription, add 30 days. If they never had another prescription after that, they were considered to have discontinued the drug or if they died. So those are the or end of eligibility or if they died. So those are the things that ended their follow-up. So we followed the SAXA people and we followed the other anti-diabetic drugs the same way for the same um, uh, length, not the same duration of follow-up, but, but ending the follow-up with, uh, with the same conditions. So what are, were our results? And again, these are interim results. This is the, the, the second uh, set of analyses I'll show you. Um, firstly, we had five endpoints. Um, again, acute liver failure, severe hypersensitivity. Um, for both of those, we looked at both electronic events and case arbitration, where we identified people based on their codes, either ICD-9 codes in the claims databases or read codes as the UK coding system in the electronic records. And then we obtained records to, obtain, to confirm the events. We got a copy of, the, electro, the, of, the, of, of the, the actual medical record to confirm what they had. <clears throat> the reasons for that is, A, these were relatively uncommon, so we could get all those medical records, it was feasible. And the other is when we tried to look um, just at the electronic data set uh, outcomes, they weren't valid enough by themselves. So we, what we analyzed, we, you know, we looked at that, we validated that. I'm, I, uh, I'm not showing you the, the data on that, but, but we didn't think it was valid to look at the electronic coded outcomes. We only believed the coded outcomes where we could validate it because we had the, the medical record in hand. For acute kidney injury, for serious infection, and for MACE, the hospitalization for heart disease, we had validated outcomes where we took the codes, we looked at the outcome definitions, and we validated the outcomes via chart review. And, and we were able to get either the codes themselves, which is unusual, or the codes plus some other combination of codes or anything else that, that were valid enough that over 90% um, positive predictive value so that we thought we, we could go forward with the electronic definition uh, um, for everybody rather than restricting ourselves to, to just the electronic, just the ones we had medical records on. So for acute kidney, kidney injury, the electronic screening was an inpatient ICD-9 diagnosis for acute kidney injury. Um, and we, we felt it was important to look at only inpatient diagnoses for kidney injury because most kidney injury, most people with kidney disease don't know they have it because it doesn't generate symptoms. But anyone who walks into a hospital is going to get a creatinine done. And so you will know they had kidney disease. On the other hand, most acute kidney injury in a hospital is not present at the time of hospitalization, but rather is due to something done to the patient while they're in the hospital. Surgery, drugs they were given, something else. So we added to that an antecedent uh, creatinine test. So somebody who got a creatinine done before they were hospitalized, um, indicating somebody knew they had a problem. An antecedent outpatient diagnosis of acute kidney injury or an antecedent emergency room visit with that diagnosis. So that was our electronic definition, and we got the medical records to show that that had over 90% positive predictive value of people who had acute kidney injury hospitalized as a reason for hospitalization, not developing in the hospital. Serious infection was analogous. We started with an inpatient ICD-9 code. We looked at antecedent antibacterial outpatient prescription or antecedent outpatient diagnosis or antecedent emergency room visit uh, diagnosis. Um, because again, lot, people develop lots of infections while they're in the hospital. Um, um, and, and that became our definition of a serious infection that is serious enough to warrant hospitalization. Acute, we, we also, by the way, because of the importance of zoster to the, the uh, analyses, separately, and because zoster usually isn't missed as an outpatient diagnosis, separately did analyses of zoster uh, not restricted to inpatient. I, I'm not showing you those data, but, but, but there's no um, positive finding there. Um, acute liver failure, uh, MACE, uh, and hypersensitivity, we just used the inpatient codes and, and proved that they were valid enough to, to be usable. 
statistical analysis. We did propensity scores. Um, it turns out we anticipated the drugs, um, the patient populations might be different, the people who get saxagliptin versus the other drugs. They ended up being much more different than we expected because what we didn't know up front was that this would become a drug of second or third choice, not a, a, a first-line drug. Um, and, but anticipating they might be different, we use propensity scores uh, via logistic regression in, within each database in order to, to choose controls that were similar to, um, in many variables to the exposed, um, it, looking at the factors associated with saxagliptin use. We then did a Cox regression uh, by using uh, calculating hazard ratios with 95% confidence intervals. The analyses were adjusted for propensity score within each database. And then outside the propensity score, things that were strong confounders, particularly what we found was prior other diabetes drug uh, use, geographic reason, re region, and the quarter of observation, prescribing changed markedly during this time. They were important enough confounders that we adjusted for them in addition outside the, the propensity score as additional adjustments to try to make the groups more similar um, um, than, than they otherwise would be. Uh, our target sample size was that across all the databases based on early estimates of utilization data, we thought we'd get an accumulation of about 113,000 new SAXA users between 2009 and 2014, assuming continued stable market penetration. Our projected use and estimated incidence rates um, gave us the statistical power to detect minimum hazard ratios of two for acute kidney injury and serious infection, 2.4 for acute kidney re liver failure, 1.5 for MACE, uh, and four for ser uh, severe hypersensitivity reactions. Th those were our assumptions at the time we, we entered the study. So baseline characteristics, just to give you a, a sense of these groups, and it's separately from Medicare, HERT, HealthCore, and the two UK databases. In terms of mean age, you can see they were, this is of course uh, artifactually more similar because the propensity score uh, uh, selection. Uh, they were very similar in age in all the databases, uh, very similar in, in gender. Uh, we don't have uh, BMI, uh, uh, body mass index, in the claims databases. We do have body mass index in the UK databases, which have medical records. Again, very similar. Prior, um, um, a previous other anti-diabetic drug use, however, was very different between the, the two groups which is why we adjusted for those separately outside of the propensity scores as well. And this shows you which specific database, uh, prior uh, uh, other anti-diabetic drugs. And, and as you would expect now, knowing how the drug is used, you know, most people, a huge proportion of the population was tried on metformin before they were put on this drug. And so you see the biguanide effect, uh, a, a fair number um, though not the majority, on sulfonylureas before and, and a smaller amount TZDs. <clears throat> in all three cases, though, more in the SAXA patients than in the non-SAXA patients, this, this has become a drug of second or third line use. And, and so this was a big difference between them that we felt we wanted to separately adjust for statistically. We also did analyses specifically looking at the subgroup of people who were on prior use separately looking at the subgroup of people who didn't have prior use, the results are the same. And again, I'm, I'm not going to go into that with you. We've done a million sub-analyses, almost anything you, you can imagine. Um, you know, the, we have massive sample sizes, so we, we, we have no problem in robustness in terms of, of being able to do lots of analyses. So what are our results? If you look at acute kidney injury, again, this is the, in, the second, um, um, this is the, our third analysis First analysis was descriptive. That's these data. Second analysis looked at outcomes. Third analysis looked at outcomes, and that's what I'm showing you. And then the final analysis is now underway. So this is the second interim analysis of outcomes. You can see there was no increased risk of acute kidney injury appearing in Medicare. Uh, there was an increased risk that we were seeing in health court data. Um, in the UK databases, there were no SAXA events. Uh, um, I identified it all. Um, and at that time, we were still doing chart reviews uh, for the UK databases. Um, and again, this is adjusted for the propensity scores for prior diabetes drug use, quarter of observation in geographic re region. Um, again, only one of the four databases had it. It shows you the importance of looking at multiple ones. 
I also can tell you we have the final results in now for acute kidney injury, and there's no increased risk in any of the databases. So, so this weak signal, statistically weak in terms of just barely statistically significant, didn't hold up in the final analysis. So across the four databases, um, again, in the second interim outcome analysis, there was a suggestion in one of the databases, not the other three. Uh, in the final analysis, it's not there. Looking at serious infections, um, no increased risk. By the way, yeah, our sample sizes are large. Um, for those who understand confidence intervals and statistics, you will almost never see confidence intervals this narrow. Um, it, you're studying Medicare, you're studying 50 million people. Um, so, um, so even a drug that ended up not having a wide use, we still have lots of users and 50 million people. U.S. Medicare, again, very tight confidence intervals, no increased risk. This is of serious infection. Same thing with HERD, um, uh, GPRD, and THIN. So none of these um, uh, showed an increased risk of, uh, of for uh, infection. We don't yet have the final answers um, uh, hot for that hot off the press yet. Um, actually, we do. I have seen the, those. And again, there's no statistically in, increase across any of the four uh, outcomes. We've also done analyses separately looking at TB and separately looking at zoster because of the, 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 the uh, concern about uh, lymphocyte. And again, there's no increased risk in those. Acute liver failure, we did um, uh, increased, no increased risk seen in Medicare, which is the largest of the databases. Again, an increased risk apparent in the the uh, uh, herd database and, and the Blue Cross data, um, no, but with small numbers, very, look at how wide these confidence intervals are. Um, no events identified in either of these two databases. So very uncommon, not seeing a problem. We don't have the final results of the final analyses uh, uh, in yet to, to know what the final cut of the data show. Um, uh, we're still underway. Um, uh, Cardiac disease, um, again, look at how tight these confidence intervals are. Uh, no increased risk, no increased risk, certainly no statistically increased risk there. So no suggestion of an increased risk. We do have the final results here. And in the final results, there's actually this point estimate below one continues and goes down a little. There's a statistically significant protective effect uh, of, uh, against cardiac disease in the Medicare data. All the other three databases they're not statistically significant, but again, the point estimate is below one. And the meta-analysis of all of them together in indicate that the, uh, a protective effect of, of saxagliptin against heart disease. Um, I, finally, severe hypersensitivity reactions. Um, they, um, no increased risk, no increased risk, no events here. And we don't yet have those final results in the, fin the final data cut. The final data cut, by the way, is a also a lot larger because you've got another uh, year's worth of data um, accumulated uh, in, in the data set. So our interim conclusions were that within HERD, within the Blue Cross data, SACSA use was associated with an increased risk of hospitalizations for acute kidney injury and hospitalizations for acute liver failure. Again, we now know that that acute injury signal did not bear out in the final data. We don't yet know about liver failure. The above associations are not consistent across the databases. No statistical associations between SACSA and serious infections, uh, uh, severe cardiac disease, and serious hypersensitivity reactions. And again, in the final data cut, we know that the cardiac disease uh, findings, in fact, become statistically protective. Future work, final analyses with updated databases and meta-analysis of course, these databases. And again, we're, we're partially done with that now, but we're not, we're not quite done yet. Um, and these are the papers we've published on it so far in terms of one, one is the, a design study. One, one of the things I feel strongly about, particularly when it's an industry-funded study that is of regulatory importance uh, of this way, is I like to publish the protocol so it is available to the public to know what we said we would do. Sometimes you just put it in, in, in uh, clintrials.gov, but, but in a study like this where we'd ha end up with multiple papers coming, coming from it and, and of, of great regulatory importance, we wanted to put our money down before we pu beforehand and, and publish what the protocol was going to be. This paper is, is the uh, determinants of sacrogliptin sacro use. This is the descriptive data that I showed you a little bit about. And the, the outcome analyses we will publish uh, uh, once they're done, which, which will be before the end of the calendar year. Um, so with that, let me see if there's any questions. Thank you. <laughs>